Hello, welcome to this webinar by the Food Packaging Forum. We're going to talk about the EU chemical strategy for sustainability and how we put it into action, challenges and opportunities for food contact materials. This is the second session in this spring webinar series of four sessions in total. And today we focus on endocrine disrupting chemicals and on mixtures of chemicals. The Food Packaging Forum shares knowledge and makes it available to different stakeholders and we encourage critical thinking. We work at the science policy interface. This webinar series is intended to provide scientific background that will support the policymakers and decision makers and influencers in their mission to implement the chemical strategy for sustainability. I would like to inform you that this webinar is being recorded and we will make it publicly available shortly after the event on our website. Please, uh, now it would be great if all participants could rename themselves using the following convention, using your first name and last name. And if you like, you can also add your affiliation. Your microphone and your camera has been muted. We will unmute you um, or enable you to unmute yourself and turn on your camera afterwards, after we've heard the two uh, speakers for our uh, Q&A and for our discussion. So you're welcome to turn on your microphone when you're invited to speak, and you can also uh, optionally turn on your camera also if you're not speaking. So um, we started this webinar series a month ago uh, in March with the, the setting the scene first session where we had two speakers that spoke to us about hazardous chemicals and how to make chemistry and the enterprise of using chemicals more sustainable and safer. If you missed that webinar, it was outstanding. I really encourage you to go and have a look at it. The recordings are available on our website. And today, I'm very, very happy to welcome uh, the next two speakers in this webinar series, Dr. Pete Myers, who will speak about endocrine disrupting chemicals, and Professor Thomas Backhaus, who will speak about the chemical mixtures. Both Pete and Thomas are also members of the Food Packaging Forum Foundation's board. So before we um, dive into the details of endocrine disrupting chemicals, I would like to take a quick look at the chemical strategy for sustainability. So this was published by the European Commission in October 2020, and it sets out goals for many different aspects of chemicals management. Um, the details of how chemicals should be managed under this new chemical strategy for sustainability still need to be defined and the discussions are actually ongoing right now. So, for example, criteria for safe and sustainable by design are being uh, set out, um, essential use is being defined and so on. Importantly, what the chemical strategy for sustainability aims to do is to make the use of chemicals aligned with the European Union's goals for the circular economy. And you can have a look at the document. Um, it's published uh, on the Commission website in case you're not familiar with it. And we'll also put links to that in the chat. We also have a presentation on our website um, that was held just very shortly after the Chemical Strategy for Sustainability was published, given by Dr. Xenia Trier from the European Environment Agency, and she puts the chemical strategy into context for food content materials. So this is really one of the first implementation test cases, if you wish, for putting the um, chemical strategy for sustainability into action. And um, Finally, I also want to just pitch very briefly for the third and the fourth session in this webinar series. The third session will be on the 20th of May, um, where we'll focus closer on plastic packaging specifically. And the fourth and final session will be on the 10th of June, where we have a speaker from the European Parliament, Martin Heusig, and we will have Professor Martin Scheringer, who will speak about simplifying chemicals. And with that, I would like to get back to our objective of the day, which is to learn more about endocrine disrupting chemicals 
by uh, Dr. Pete Myers. And afterwards, we will um, learn about chemical mixtures with Professor Thomas Backhaus. So Pete, I would like to invite you to start sharing your screen. And while you're doing that, I'll maybe give a very, very short word of introduction. Um, we don't have enough time to introduce Pete <laughs> with all his achievements. Um, but very briefly, he is one of the founding fathers of endocrine disruption. Um, he's been working on this topic for the last, I guess, 30 years. Is, is that fair enough to say? Fair enough. And um, what, best known for his publication, Our Stone Future, which is a, a book that was published in 1996, which is extremely recommendable and readable and still very valid today. So with that, Pete, thank you for being here today and over to you. Thanks. Thanks, Jane. Can you hear me? Yes, I can Great. hear you. And you can see the slides. Yes. Excellent. And uh, thanks for that introduction and also setting the stage by describing the chemical strategy for sustainability. Um, now, I know that most of the people uh, on this call are not specialists in endocrine disruption. Most are not endocrinologists. Most are not even scientists. But you, the none of the above, are my intended audience. You are central to ensuring that the decisions that are made on implementation of the chemical strategy for sustainability are based upon basic understanding of what is unique about endocrine disruption and why what works for standard toxicology will not work for endocrine disruption if the goal is to protect public health. So I apologize to my fellow specialists if I appear to be simplifying too much. In the process of simplification, I'm gonna do so with the goal of remaining true to the science while making it accessible to people who must and will make important policy decisions. So for them, here's what you need to know. First of all, nothing in endocrine disruption makes sense in the, in, except in the light of Charles Darwin's evolution. The endocrine system is a highly evolved collection of hormones, the glands that make them, the hormone receptors, and the systems that are responsive to them, governing many bodily functions. Just about everything that makes us human, from events leading to conception, to birth, to toddlers, to development of sex, to old age, all of that depends upon proper functioning of the endocrine system. So this is really important. Hormones are a key part of the endocrine system. They are a highly evolved collection of chemicals that carry messages in our bloodstream through our bodies, from the glands to where they make things happen. And what do they make happen? Uh, as I mentioned above, they, they guide our development that begins with successful fertilization of an egg and goes through to life, to death, all the way through. And it makes sure you have functioning organisms, or excuse me, organs. Yes, definitely functioning organisms. No dementia, a wor working brain, an immune system that works. The bottom line is that the endocrine system is central to all that we need to know uh, all that we need to make life successful. And so what, um, what that means is that if there is a dysfunctional disrupted endocrine uh, system, it can be a disaster, sometimes mortal. And if not that, at least debilitating, weakening and degrading of health and well-being. Now I'll get to the health consequences later, we depend upon some 50 or more hormones to do this signaling. Each one carries a different message shaped by evolution. At least three requirements shape that evolution. First, the need to be effective at very low doses because the bloodstream needs to be able to accommodate a whole lot of signaling going on. The receptor must be finely tuned and reactive specifically to that hormone. And the diversity of hormone receptor partners must be sufficient to control the full panoply of responses needed to guide development, growth, and other responsibilities of the endocrine system. In the bloodstream, hormones flow past and into tissues. There's a depiction of hormones coming from a gland that produce them going into the bloodstream and then ultimately winding up in cells where they cause their effects. This is important for a cell 
for a cell to react to a hormone, the cell must have a receptor on the cell membrane, inside the cell body, or inside the cell nucleus. Not just any old receptor, one evolved to be especially sensitive to that hormone. Endocrinologists like to talk about a lock and key model. The receptor is the lock, the hormone is the key. If it fits, it turns on the receptor for its interactions with other cell constituents. If it doesn't fit, it has no effect. The response to the hormone also or concentration upon its local chemical environment and the tissue in which the receptor is located. Hormones perform this message at really low doses, parts per, tr per trillion and lower. Those concentrations are what you're measuring in the bloodstream. So what about endocrine disruption? Get to endocrine disruption. So if there's no receptor, there's no response. Uh, if there is a receptor, there's a response. It can be from the surface of the cell membrane or it can be inside the cell nucleus. And they do different things in those two different locations. The Endocrine Society is the world's largest professional association of endocrinologists. There are over 18,000 of them around the world. They are the go-to physicians and scientists when you've got a problem with your endocrine system or you want to protect it from damage. They are the world's experts. You don't want to go to a quack. You want an endocrinologist. They take endocrine disruption very seriously and have been deeply involved in advising the European Commission and the Parliament on the hazards of endocrine disruption. Fortunately, in my opinion, the European Council took the society's advice very seriously in formulating those parts of the chemical strategy for sustainability relevant to endocrine disruption. This is an important breakthrough in managing endocrine disruption as a threat to human health. The Endocrine Society defines an endocrine disrupting chemical, which we'll call EDCs here, as a chemical that is not part of human body chemistry or a mis mixture of those chemicals that can interfere with any aspect of hormone action. At least a thousand molecules used in commerce have been identified that are certainly or highly likely endocrine disrupting compounds. They're found in many products. They're found in the environment. Today, they are ubiquitous. They're in developing, they're in people, they're in the developing fetus, they're already causing health problems. They come at us from the most unexpected and seemingly safe sources because we didn't know better when we designed them. They're in, designed them. They're in thermal paper, they're in airline baggage receipts, they're in food packaging, they're in dust from furniture. They come from many different places. So there are multiple ways in which the chemicals that interfere with hormone action work. They can work by altering hormone action, altering hormone production, increasing or decreasing receptor density and other mechanisms. I'm gonna focus on a third additional mechanism of endocrine disruption, which is the one most people think about, which is that some EDCs bind with receptors and either mimic or block normal hormone action. So here we have that slide again that I showed you earlier with hormones going into the, into the blood system, no receptor, no response, cellular functions affected by hormone binding at the cell membrane or in the, in the cell nucleus. If there's a, an EDC present, it can block or mimic uh, the hormone, bind with the receptor and cause an adverse effect. Now, um, when that happens, I moved ahead of myself in slides, excuse me. When, when that happens, the receiving tissue may be fooled into thinking that a real signal has been sent and it's time to turn on its cellular processes when it's not. Or if it's a blocking event, the receiving tissue doesn't do what it was supposed to do when the body needs it. Both of those effects can cause lasting harm, not just for the moment, but for the duration of the life of the organism. There are many published examples of signals blocked or faked by EDCs in the womb whose consequences don't become obvious until after birth. 
sometimes years or decades after birth. And now there's even evidence that I'll summarize later that some of those disruptions can be maintained down generations. Now I'm gonna to have to become a little bit more nerdish at this point because of a vital aspect of how cells sensitive to hormones and EDCs behave. This is one of the defining evolutionary consequences that differentiate EDCs from traditional toxic compounds and why you have to use endocrinology to understand the hazards instead of using standard toxicology, okay? So let's look at a slide here. Um, this is a slide that shows receptor, so you've got a bunch of receptors in a cell or on the surface of the cell membrane. And as the concentration of the hormone goes up, as the green line shows, the, the numbers of receptors occupied also goes up. And this begins to happen at very low doses, part beneath parts per trillion. And during the, at the earliest phases of that rise is when the, cur when the cell is most sensitive to hormone presence. As it continues to rise, it ultimately reaches a zone where additional changes in hormone receptor occupancy no longer affect the effect of the, of the, of the cell, of the hormone uh, arriving in the cell. So this second graph shows that specifically. The yellow curve shows the response of the cell mechanism, in this case, a change in, uh, involved in um, MCF in certain cells used to evaluate the effect of estradiol, the human hormone, est analog of estrogen. And you can see that the concentration of estradiol leading to the most, most response, the biggest response occurred at 10 to the 12th, 10 to the minus, 10 to the minus 12th, to 10 to the minus 10th concentration of estrogen. And then it declined. That's the key thing. As receptor occupancy goes up, it goes through a maximum and then it declines. That's called downregulation of uh, the system. And that's exceedingly important. It's also something that you never see with traditional toxicology. The more, at first, the more receptors that are bound, the bigger the response. But as the number of bound receptors grows, something that something unexpected happens, the response starts to weaken. And with too many bound receptors, the response is eliminated. So instead of a simple story, the higher the dose, the bigger the response, actually what happens is that if the dose gets too high, the response shuts down. It's called downregulation by endocrinologists. This never happens in traditional toxicology where the dose does make the poison. But with hormones, a dose that's outside and above the expected range shuts down the system, shuts down the response. Why that happens is uncertain. Many endocrinologists argue that it's a protective measure designed by evolution to protect the cell from too big an effect. Whatever the reason, it's a basic fact of endocrinology. As receptor occupancy increases with dose, at low doses, the response increases rapidly only to decrease at much higher. I mentioned a cascade of molecular events earlier on. Here's another detail that differentiates endocrine disruption from toxicology. This discovery in this next slide was actually awarded as a, uh, Thomas Sutherland received the Nobel Prize in 1971 for this, this discovery. So it's not exactly new science, even though it's, it has stood the text of, test of time. It's even taught in every endocrinology 101 course today. And that's, and what this slide shows is that when a hormone binds the receptor up at the top, it sets in motion an amplification process. It depends, there are lots of variations on this detail. Exactly how much the amplification is, takes place is not uh, certain, but the implications are that the amplification can be very large, such that one receptor binding can lead to a million or more cellular events downstream. 
whatever that factor is, the amplification factor, the ability of a small number of receptor events to disrupt endocrine disrupted uh, directed biology means it is impossible to identify a threshold beneath which exposure is safe. Impossible. Serious research and mathematical modeling has gone farther, including that endocrine disrupting chemicals like carcinogens have no threshold. Now, a third reason why standard toxicology is ill-prepared Ill to deal with endocrine disruption is conceptual. And, and I, I wanna ask you all to think about the following question. Um, are low doses really low? What's a part per billion? Well, one way to look at it is, is that uh, part per billion is one pancake and a stack of pancakes 4,000 miles high, which makes it seem very low. But how many molecules are in a drop of serum that contains one part per billion of bisphenol A? It's actually quite large. It's 2.65 trillion molecules of BPA are in that one drop of serum. Now, really excellent labs can measure down to sub to, to beneath one part per billion, but most of them can't of BPA in blood. So how can you talk about, how can you imagine determining what the threshold is if you have to go down to those levels which you cannot even measure? So we are left with the conclusion that practically and theoretically, there's no threshold involved in endocrine disruption. Endocrine disruption is an evolutionary blind spot. It's like a computer hacker already armed with the password. One hacker alone can cause immense harm. Unless you've set up specific software to detect and counteract a hacker's intrusion, you can't control the damage. And unfortunately, because we didn't know to test for this type of toxicity until recently, many chemicals on the market and in use in human bodies and in human bodies that can hack are there that can hack the system. Evolution has not had time to design and implement the protective software. It will take generations. This is why it is so important that the chemical strategy for sustainability incorporates endocrinological principles and why its implementation must continue that commitment. So what are the currently identified health effects of endocrine disruption? I don't have a lot of time here. And we know there's a lot to discover. I say identified because the certainty of causation by EDCs varies widely across these many different conditions. For none is the science certain, but scientific certainty is a very high bar, far too high to use to justify inaction if the goal is to protect public health. For all these health problems, there is sufficient evidence published in the peer reviewed literature to cause concern. And for most, there certainly is enough evidence to invoke the precautionary principle, as I understand it, and take preventative action. Now, one of the, one of the effects of endocrine disrupting chemicals that has attracted a lot of attention in the last couple of months is sperm count decline. Uh, roughly a 50% decline over the last five decades. Work started by Europeans, Neil Skakibach and his team in Denmark, and now continued by their, their colleagues, and especially Shauna Swan, who has just written a book called Countdown. And it goes into this decline and how endocrine disrupting compounds and other factors have contributed to the sperm count decline. But I want you to look at the dotted red line. This decline is, decline is continued for five decades. The slope of the curve is not slowing. It's, it's been constant over that entire period. And if you extrapolate that line down to zero, it reaches, the median sperm count reaches zero in 2045. That means half of young men in 2045 reaching the, their reproductive age, will have zero sperm count. Those two other lines, blue and orange, show what might happen if we begin to get control of this decline by reducing the factors that are causing it, including exposure to endocrine disrupting compounds. This gives you some sense as to how seriously endocrinologists and epidemiologists 
take this issue. 50% uh, of young men being infertile is a recipe for disaster. There's another re recipe for disaster that's involved here, which involves what's called transgenerational inheritance. And that's the following. Here you've got four women, grandma, mom, daughter, and granddaughter. And there's now very serious evidence from multiple labs around the world, and, in, and now some hints from epidemiology, that exposures to grandmother can cause effects in granddaughter four generations down without, without exposure in the intervening generations. That would seem to me to be a huge clarion call for precautionary protections. We can't take the chance that the exposures we are allowing today can manifest themselves that far into the future, especially since some of the most recent data show that sometimes the consequences of fetal exposure in grandma are not evident in mom. It skips generations. And I can tell you right now that no standard toxicological test that's ever been done in the world has considered this sort of transgenerational effect. Lastly, the last point I'll make on this is the cost of EDCs. A number of people, including a team of, of um, economists and endocrine disruption specialists, got together a few years ago and estimated as best they could, given the data that they had using very rigorous procedures, what are the costs to the European Union on an annual basis of exposure to endocrine disruptions? And this slide covers uh, it in two different ways. On the left, you've got the cost by health effect. Is it premature death? Is it neurological impact? Is it obesity and diabetes? And on the right, you have cost by EDC type, uh, pesticides, plastics, flame retardants, other. Um, the summed costs is of this simple estimate is on the order of 160 billion euros a year. It's not cheap. And the authors of which I was one noted in their calculations that they were able, we were able to obtain sufficient data to do the rigorous calculations for at most 5% of known EDCs, 5% of known. So the number is likely to be much bigger. And this was confirmed by uh, estimates from economists in the European Commission. Jane, I've gone on a long time. Um, I didn't realize how far that was. <laughs> I apologize for that. I've got one more slide, is that okay? Sure. Um, there is a way out of this, and it's another part of the chemical strategy for sustainability and it's safe and sustainable chemistry. We have enough science to know how to do that now. This is one example um, of a public paper that was published in 2012, laying out an intellectual framework that helps us understand how we can avoid endocrine disruption in the next generation of materials sold to consumers and put into commerce. Thank you, and I apologize for how long I went. No worries, Pete. That was really, really interesting and fascinating. And I apologize for the technical difficulties we had at the beginning. I hope that you could uh, hear and see Pete's slides. If you have questions, then I invite you to put them in the chat. Um, we'll try to get to them as soon as we have finished with Thomas's presentation. Um, so, Thomas, I'd like to invite you to please unmute yourself, turn on your video and share your screen, please, so that we can um, learn from you what chemical mixtures are, how they are a challenge and how they can be addressed. Um, okay, I hope you can see my screen and I hope you can actually hear me. And I need to switch to the Yes. Uh, uh, presenters view exactly. just a second. Um, that is always the beauty Great. of having two screens. Okay, does that work? Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Thomas, um, just a, one quick word of introduction. 
You are a professor at University of Gothenburg in Sweden, and you have worked on many European uh, uh, committee expert groups. I'm not going to go into all of them, but you are clearly a designated expert on chemical mixtures. So with that, over to you, please. Well, thanks, no pressure. Thank you for that. Uh, yeah, hi, everybody. Um, so within the next, say, half an hour or so, I'm going to talk a bit about chemical mixtures and especially how they are considered within the new chemical strategy. And before I'm going to uh, raise some concerns or talk about those things that I think are a bit, um, yeah, that still need to be done. I think I would really like to start by basically congratulating everybody who was involved in putting that chemical strategy together to get it through the comitology, to get it through parliament, to get it uh, through all the different discussion circles. I really think uh, the new strategy uh, pushes the envelope. It takes up a lot of critical issues uh, that we need to think about, that we need to implement into regulation. So this is a real good step forward. Um, so I think that is really uh, something that I would like to start with. One of the issues that are specifically taken up in the strategy are chemical mixtures, are uh, questions related to how do we account for the fact that humans and the environment are exposed to complex chemical mixtures. We know that the overall effect, whether it's endocrine disruption, whether it's uh, carcinogenesis, whether it is uh, ecotoxicity, all of that is uh, changed by the presence of chemical mixtures. I would like to go through three issues that I think are sort of still problems that are not accounted for in the chemical strategy. And I would like to explain why this is the case or what are the consequences and why these are gaps that I think still need to be closed. Uh, this concerns cumulative exposure it is uh, considering the different chemical groups that are on the European market that the environment and humans are exposed to. And that is the holistic perspective that we need to take in order to get a grip on the problem of chemical mixtures. So those three issues is what I would like to spend my time on now to walk you through that. So the first thing, cumulative uh, exposure, is actually, scientifically speaking, very, very simple. Cumulative exposure is the exposure to the same compound, but coming by a different pathways, coming from different products and different processes. And the critical issue here is that a registrant, which is a chemical importer or chemical producer, is not obliged to take into account the exposure to the same substance from other manufacturers or importers. That basically means according to REACH, which is the say fundamental or basic chemical regulatory framework that we have, every company, every registrant has its own little environment that does not contain any other chemical, that does not contain any other exposure source for the compound uh, that they are producing, that they are marketing. Um, and of course, from a scientific perspective, uh, that doesn't make any sense. Uh, an organism that is exposed to a chemical doesn't really care who was actually responsible for the emission of that chemical from which kind of consumer product or process uh, that came. It is just the chemical that matters. And that has consequences. And um, this goes for a lot of different chemicals. I'm just picking bisphenol A here as one example, simply because this is one of the high production volume chemicals in Europe. And one of the nice things uh, with REACH is the underlying databases are at least partly open to the public so that you can actually get a bit of a feel for what is actually going on. And what we see here are just the companies that have registered bisphenol A 
for the European market. So it's a list that you can start to read through. You can see uh, some well-known names, some smaller companies. You see that they are basically located all over Europe and you continue to read and you continue to read and you end up with the realization that we have 64 companies that are producing and marketing the chemical in Europe. And that basically means that each of those 64 registrants does its own little risk assessment uh, and makes its own safety assessment. But a human being or a lake or a river is of course exposed from the totality of all those uh, emission events that are underlying the use of all those different products. Um, so basically what we have is the, say, um, the fundamental idea uh, on which REACH is based is that we have a company or we have a consumer product that is emitting a chemical and then we have a recipient. It's a lake here, but it can also be a human being or it is also a human being or another uh, type of ecosystem. And that is the conceptual picture um, that uh, every regulation is built upon. But of course, what we've just seen is that reality looks a bit differently. We have different emission sources, and that means in order to protect human health, to protect the environment, we need to account for the totality of processes that lead to the emission of a chemical into the environment. Bisphenol A is just one of many, many examples here. The other issue relates to the fundamental structure of how we are regulating chemicals. We are regulating chemicals not in relation to uh, its chemical structure uh, or something like that, but we regulate them in relation to their uses. We have a different regulatory framework for pesticides, for pharmaceuticals, for general industrial chemicals, et cetera, et cetera. And if we are looking at the chemical strategy, especially into the annexes there, then we can see that those different chemical classes are specifically mentioned. So the aim of the chemical strategy here is to introduce or reinforce provisions to take into account the combination effects of chemicals in water, food contact materials, food additives, toys, detergents, and cosmetics. And if you're reading through that list, you very quickly realize, aren't we missing something? Isn't there a group of chemicals that we have been discussing for decades now and that we know are problematic from all different perspectives? And are they not important from a mixture perspective? So how is that with the pesticides? Those compounds that are made to be toxic, that are sprayed in thousands or even millions of kilograms uh, into the open environment, where the environment is exposed, where human beings are indirectly exposed or even directly if uh, you have a near field situation, et cetera. So how is that with uh, the pesticides? And if you're starting to look through the supporting documents uh, for the chemical strategy, then you find that they are actually mentioned there. It is stated that uh, for pesticides and biocides, and um, that is a specific distinction that we only have in Europe, in the US American system, pesticides and biocides are called just pesticides, but here we have two different frameworks. So for pesticides and biocides, uh, we already have provisions in place that require to consider cumulative and synergistic effects. For pesticides, progress has been made in developing a target methodology and work will be accelerated so that existing provisions can be fully implemented. Okay, so it looks like uh, one of the reasons why pesticides are not specifically mentioned within the new uh, chemical strategy is there are already uh, provisions and uh, legal framework in place where we have to account for cumulative and synergistic effects. So there's nothing that needs to be done. And that is actually a point where I would uh, 
being somebody who is working a lot with environmental uh, organisms, with ecosystem health and things like that, this is a situation where I really would uh, not completely agree. If we are looking at what we are doing in terms of pesticide risk assessment at the moment, so we have to dive really a bit into the regulatory texts here in order to see what is going on here. So I'm trying to guide you through that. So for pesticides, we have uh, a regulation um, that specifies the approval criteria for active substances. So which criteria does a chemical have to fulfill in order to be allowed to be marketed as a pesticide on the European market? And what it states here are two different things uh, in relation to their effects on human health and in their relation to effects on the environment. So if we're just looking at uh, the human health, uh, that is uh, um, Article 4, um, um, Paragraph 2a here, it is said here that pesticides shall not have any harmful effects on human health, taking into account known cumulative and synergistic effects. And this is what the chemical strategy relates to. So we already have a European law in place that basically requires that we are taking cumulative and synergistic effects into place. On a technical level, uh, it's a bit of a, a problem that we have those weasel words here, where the scientific methods accepted by the authority to assess such effects are available. Uh, but let's say we have that and uh, EFSA is actually moving that forward. So things seem to be pretty much under control there. There are a lot of technical details that still need to be sorted out, but all in all things are moving forward. The problem is when we're looking at the environmental side of things, because here it is simply stated that pesticides shall not have any unacceptable effect on the environment. We do not have any specific provisions that uh, talk about cumulative or synergistic effects here. So we have in the current legislation a massive imbalance between what we need to do in relation to human health in comparison to what we need to do in relation to ecosystem health. Uh, and this imbalance is actually not taken up and we are not really moving things forward here. And when it comes to the pesticides, we know that we have massive problems, especially on the environment, uh, talking about insect decline, bee health and all those things. And the mixture issue always plays a critical issue uh, in, all those, um, yeah, in all those problems. So I really think um, the chemical strategy has missed the opportunity here to basically say, if we do that for humans, we should basically do a similar approach also for the environment. And I think that's a missed opportunity here. The other thing is, or the third issue that I just would like to point out is um, the, yeah, what I call the holistic perspective. And if we're just looking at what we're finding in the environment. And this is just a small Swedish river next to the city of Gothenburg, where we were going out and we were just trying to get an idea what chemicals are actually occurring in that small river. We find 84 chemicals. Um, those are the 84 chemicals that are there at concentrations that we can measure. And those are the chemicals that are within the scope of the analytical methods that we were using. Um, but this is a rather typical chemical footprint. Uh, but what we can see here is if we are starting to group the chemicals according to where they are coming from, that they are coming from a multitude of different sources. So we have plasticizers in there, we have food additives in there, we have different types of pesticides and their metabolites in there. We have pharmaceuticals in there because the river runs uh, near a city and things like that. So it really is a reflection of the complexity and of the fact that we're using thousands of different chemicals for I don't know how many purposes. From those 84 chemicals that we find there, 
roughly half of them are falling under the REACH regulation. Or the other way around, half of them are falling under other regulations, like, for example, the regulation on pesticides. But if we are looking at what the Commission is plan, as, uh, plans on doing in relation to mixtures, it is very, very much focused on REACH only. The Commission will, and that's a quote from the chemical strategy, assess how to best introduce in REACH a new assessment factor for chemical safety assessment of substances. And then it starts to become very, very vague on what is happening with the others. Introduce or reinforce provisions to take into account. And again, the pesticides are completely missing here. The pharmaceuticals are also completely missing here, et cetera, et cetera. So I think one of the challenges that we have with uh, mixtures is that they are comprising chemicals that are coming from different regulatory silos. Some of them are industrial chemicals, some of them are pesticides, some of them are heavy metals and things like that. And we need to think about how do we actually account for that. We can't say, okay, let's just look at REACH chemicals, because then we're ignoring half of the chemicals um, that an ecosystem in this case, but also humans are exposed to. We need to actually think about how can we capture the bigger picture here. Okay, um, that is basically all that I wanted to say. So uh, in summary, I would really uh, emphasize that I'm having really mixed feeling. On the one hand, the chemical strategy is a real step forward. It is far more progressive and far more ambitious than uh, I dare to hope for. So it's really, really, uh, um, yeah, it's pushing the envelope. Uh, the question is whether we manage to implement things uh, that are listed there, but I really think it's a step forward. But if you're starting to look at the uh, details and uh, at the issues that we're facing when it comes to chemical mixtures, I really think there are at least three issues um, where the chemical strategy does not go far enough. Cumulative exposures is definitely something where we do not need any scientific evaluation or anything like that. It is absolutely obvious that when you're exposed to, you don't really care where the chemical comes from. That is important when you want to do something about the exposure, but when it comes to how big is the risk for your own health, for the health of your family, for the health of an ecosystem, it is the chemical that matters and not where it comes from. This is really ignored and we have to do something about that. The different chemical groups are, are completely unevenly considered. A lot of focus is on REACH, which on the one hand makes a lot of sense because REACH is the basic framework. REACH is the one where we have most chemicals. We have tens of thousands of chemicals regulated under REACH. So it makes a lot of sense to uh, include REACH and perhaps even to start with REACH. But I really think we need to go beyond that. Pesticides, biocides, pharmaceuticals, all those chemicals are regulated differently because we know that they are biologically highly active. So we actually can't just leave them uh, aside and just focus on the industrial chemicals. And that is the last point that I wanted to make. We need to develop a holistic perspective uh, in order to actually protect human health and the environment. And with that, I would like to actually finish. Thanks for your attention. Wonderful, Thomas. Thank you so much. That was a very in <laughs> insightful presentation. I hope um, it wasn't too technical. I don't know. Let's let's let the audience speak now. So I will um, give you the opportunity to unmute yourself and to share your video. Um, there's a couple of questions that came in through the chat. Uh, Pete's been doing a great job answering some of them already. Um, Let's go to this one from uh, Sitzel, Dieu Kair. Sorry, I probably said that wrong. Sitzel, do you want to unmute yourself and ask your question, please? 
And if you like, turn on your video. Yes, I can try. It's just that the, while you were speaking, uh, Thomas, I was looking at the farm to fork strategy plans just very quickly. And I could see that there are actually some plans uh, related to pesticides under that strategy. So I was wondering if we are just here having a case of some plants written one place and other plants written another place. I don't know if you have looked into that. I have not. So it's really just an open question from my side. I don't know yeah. anything about it. Um, there are uh, efforts and plans to actually reduce the risk from pesticides. Um, that's the host has asked you to start your video. I don't want to start a video. Okay, fine. Sorry. Are, are you uh, sorry? Uh, okay, now I know what you mean. Sorry. Yes, I can do that. Hang on a second. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. I, I wasn't sure what you were referring to. Sorry for that. Um, there are efforts, uh, um, and they are quite systematic, partly uh, to reduce the risk of pesticides. Um, that's definitely something uh, that makes a lot of sense, and that uh, is definitely something that I've, I would really like to support. But the problem is um, that it, it doesn't get us out of the issue of the um, of the combined exposures. Um, because what we very often see is, for example, that we are facing out one pesticide and we're bringing another pesticide on the market. Uh, that is also a discussion that we are not having uh, often enough. We also have the issue that um, we are using the same chemicals in completely different settings. Mm -hmm. So for example, the neonicotinoids are a good example there. The ne that also relates back to the issue of cumulative exposure. Uh, we have a ban uh, of uh, neonicotinoid use in Europe. Uh, we have still a lot of emergency authorizations, but all in all, we have a ban. But uh, what we do not have is a ban on the use of neonicotinoids uh, in veterinary products. Mm -hmm. A lot of the flea medication, uh, a lot of the flea um, colors for dogs and cats contain huge amounts of neonicotinoids, uh, which is actually uh, leading to an exposure of the environment and of the people that are in close contact with those pets. So again, we need to uh, take a look at all the different emission sources. Another example are we have, we have uh, several herbicides that have been taken off the market and that are now used as uh, paints for houses. And that means every time it rains, uh, it's washing down into the surface waters. And we're now finding the same chemicals there, just not from agricultural uses, but from urban building. Um, so I think, again, it's the holistic perspective that we actually really need to uh, take in order to identify which compounds matter, uh, which kind of mixtures uh, matter, and what can we actually do about them. Okay, great. Well, thank you, uh, Sitzel and Thomas. Um, we only have a couple of minutes left. So if you have any urgent pressing questions, I invite you to unmute yourselves, turn on your camera so we can see who wants to speak. You can raise your hand, put, put your questions in the chat. Um, I have a couple of questions. Um, Pete, one question for you. Um, how many EDC chemicals are there? At, that depends upon whose lists you use and how rigorous um, the criteria are. Um, there are lists that identify well over a thousand uh, compounds in, in use that qualify as endocrine disrupting compounds. Um, those don't all satisfy, for example, uh, the criteria that some of the, for example, EFSA might apply, but they do identify compounds that even if they aren't certain um, are likely to be, be identified as endocrine disrupting compounds as more research is done. The problem is that most chemicals in commerce, most of them have never been tested for endpoints related to endocrine disruption. Most of them, easily 90, 95% have never been tested. And do we know, just a quick follow-up, maybe Thomas can also answer that, how many chemicals there are in commerce in total? Like, what are we talking about? 
Uh, that's that's uh, that is something that is not easy. To, it's an easy question, but not an easy answer because that depends a lot on where you are using them and whether they are registered there. Um, in in Europe, we have something like I don't. I think it's around. Uh, don't quote me on that. I think it's around twenty thousand chemicals that we have registered under reach right now. But the problem is all of them give rise to degradation products. We have a lot of chemicals coming in uh, from other countries via imported goods. So it is extremely hard to get a reliable number uh, of chemicals. But it's far more than we can handle at the moment. I think that's uh, the take home message there. Yeah. I would agree with Thomas, but if I could leap forward to in the little bit of time remaining to answer Peter Benish's last question, most recent question about Europe, Europe focusing on uh, estrogens, androgens, and thyroid and testing for EDCs. Um, that's been the main focus in the US, but it's woefully inadequate. As I mentioned, there are at least at least 50 uh, molecules used by the hormone system for signaling, um, almost certainly a lot more than that. And I think they're all, we already know that the EAT and the estrogen androgen thyroid system misses some really big ones. It misses metabolic signaling um, molecules that are involved in the generation of, of diabetes. And diabetes is, has emerged over the last um, 10 years, particularly by research by the Spanish scientist Angel Nadal, as one of the key endpoints of endocrine disrupting compounds, particularly BPA. And also so it, to metabo so other metabolic effects like obesity. Yeah. Right? yeah. So just a quick question, Pete, sorry to cut you off. Um, uh, Gustav Bors is asking, are there cures or medicines that can, can undo effects of EDCs? I think that's an important question. It's a vital question, and thank you for asking it. Um, the answer is, if, if the EDC effect is what's called activational, where you're an adult and a hormone goes up or a hormone goes down, it's, not gonna, it's probably not going to have an, a, a big effect, and it will most likely be reversible through pharmaceutical uh, uses. But if it's a developmental exposure, like to a baby that grows up with a, a brain that isn't functional, you can't rewind the tape. Yeah, It's impossible to rewind the tape. And also keep in mind that some EDC action is carcinogenic, and we know yeah. how difficult it is to treat cancers. Um, one real quick last question. Uh, from Joel Amar, if classic toxicology can't be used, what kind of risk assessment can be used to either of you? Well, I think what we need to use is hazard assessment, hazard assessment of endocrine, and for endocrine disruption. If it's an endocrine disruption, it is disrupting chemical and it's, uh, and the confirmation is, is uh, secure, um, it should not be used. Okay. No need for risk assessment, it shouldn't be used. Thomas? What do you say about risk assessment for mixtures? Uh, uh, I don't think that there is a, a clear cut answer there, but uh, the first thing uh, will be that although we know the limits of whatever classic toxicology is, I think we are still completely underusing that tool that we have. Uh, I mean, it is blind for a lot of issues and we need to think about how we can capture that. But I, from my perspective, one of the main challenges that we're facing is that even those, say, classic toxicological or ecotoxicological data, we are missing those for a lot of the chemicals that are out there. And perhaps that is a huge challenge, especially when it comes to mixtures, because if I'm looking at a mixture of 85 compounds, and I don't even know how toxic they are individually, I can't really say a lot about the overall toxicity of that mixture. And these are all chemicals that are on the market legally right now. So with that, our time is up. I want to thank our speakers for the fantastic presentations. We will make this presentation available on the website afterwards for your reference. Thank you so much for joining and thank you for your questions. Take care. Have a good day.